How hops and majestic magpies? Welcome to Vignettes and Vigilantes, a podcast about films in the DC animated universe. I'm your host, RK Muse, and today we're looking at Taken, a 2008 film directed by Pierre Morel. This film can be summed up as the European adventure from hell, but at least you've got a terrifying retired badass of a father. With that short descriptor, let's nosedive into it. Taken opens with home videos of a young girl celebrating her birthday. She's wearing a birthday hat, has a big cake in front of her, and is being cuddled and kissed by her mother. She opens a present with a horse toy inside, and it's revealed to be her fifth birthday, always a fun time. As she blows out the candles, the home video ends, and the owner of the videos, Brian with a Y Mills, wakes with a start. He lives in a dark apartment and keeps a framed picture of that girl, now older, on his end table. And just so we're clear going forward, he is the little girl in the video's father. He's not just some weirdo who has home videos of somebody he doesn't know, so don't worry about that. The next morning, Brian goes to an electronics store where the owner warmly welcomes him and then busts his balls, saying that Brian has been eyeing a karaoke machine for months. The owner even says that if he charged Brian a dollar for every day Brian stopped by to look at the karaoke machine, then he could have purchased it himself. The owner then reiterates that this machine is favored by all the professionals, like Mariah Carey, Gwen Stefani, and Beyonce. Like any dorky dad, Brian says, who's Beyonce? But at any rate, he takes it off the owner's hands. You might think Brian will karaoke the shit out of Sunday Bloody Sunday or Mysterious Ways, but singing's not really his bag, baby. He's more interested in giving his daughter, Kim, the birthday surprise of her life. Kim really likes to sing, and Brian thinks this will be the perfect present for her. Not wrong, any kind of singing practice will help. Brian wraps the gift with textbook precision, looking much nicer than anything I've ever wrapped, and this is when we begin to realize that Brian is a man of textbook precision. Brian shows up to a sprawling party in a very nice Southern California suburb. He is approached by a bodyguard who instructs Brian to go to the adult section of the party. Brian says he's Kim's father, and the guard snipes that he works for Kim's father. A bristle Brian tells the guard that he's Kim's real father. Luckily, or unluckily, judging by the look she gives him, a phoenix of a woman comes over to the guard and tells him it's okay. She coolly greets Brian, and it's revealed she is Lenore, Brian's ex-wife and Kim's mother, whom he used to affectionately call Lenny. She's not very receptive to the nickname anymore, or to Brian himself, and tells Brian to put his wrapped karaoke machine on the table with the other presents. However, a relentless Brian wants to give Kim the present himself. Before the former spouses can argue further, Kim runs over to Brian and gives him a warm hug. At his behest, she eagerly opens the present and is delighted by the karaoke machine. Lenore doesn't think it's really a relevant or appropriate gift, but Kim, against her mother's wishes, wants to be a professional singer one day. Brian snaps a picture of her holding the karaoke machine. Kim and Brian hug again, and then Kim's stepfather, Stuart, pops by with a fucking horse. Brian probably doesn't feel all that great with Stuart throwing around his money, but Stuart is just plain friendly and makes small talk with Brian. Still, Brian is clearly out of his element and feels uncomfortable with Stuart's wealth. But I wouldn't worry, as he's not her father, Todd. I mean, Brian. That evening, Brian gets his film developed in a flash and sticks the picture of Kim into his photo album. He flips through the other pictures, which includes one of her holding two kittens and another from her fifth party, which opened the film. The doorbell rings and Brian's three friends, Sam, Casey, and Bernie, show up. They josh with Brian about his retiree status, and they then toast Kim's birthday. Brian's friends offer to dig into Stuart's past, which will come back in a big way as the series progresses, but Brian tells them not to worry about it. Anyway, they then reveal that Brian retired from the CIA in order to be closer to Kim, and they then tell the audience a tale of Brian skipping out on work to attend Kim's birthday, as he promised to never miss that special occasion. As a result, Brian was punished by being transferred to Alaska. Not the worst state to be transferred to, I mean, you've got gorgeous scenery and you can see brown bears at the salmon run. However, this was all an elaborate plan to get Brian to agree to assist them with a freelance protection job, which is all about guarding and protecting a pop star during one of her concerts. Brian's ears perk up as Kim wants to be a professional singer, and networks really are everything. He agrees to do it, and the money doesn't hurt any. Brian is excited for safe, easy work where nobody dies, which I'm sure he's just craving for after a lifetime of military work and espionage. It's now the night of the concert, and Brian and his pals are seen escorting the ultra-popular singer Shira in front of a volley of fans. Brian has been tasked with guarding Shira in her dressing room. Shira warms up with her vocal coach, and Brian compliments her singing. The two introduce each other, and Brian quickly asks her if she has any tips for Kim regarding the professional singing industry. Shira sarcastically tells Brian to tell Kim to choose another career as she goes on stage with her entourage. As the concert progresses, Brian is playing cards with the dudes and receives a call from Kim. He stands out in the hall to chat with her, telling her that he's doing security work for Shira, which impresses Kim. Brian's happy to speak with his daughter, and Kim invites him to lunch the next day, which is a real nice invitation. He comes back and updates the guys, who are happy to see some progress in their father-daughter relationship. 
Her set list concluded, Shira descends the stage and is being transferred back to her dressing room, but a gate pops open and several rabid fans come running at her. Brian escorts her away from the chaos, but a knife-wielding stalker pops out. Brian easily takes him down, beckons Casey over to defuse the situation, and gets Shira into the SUV. He gives her a soda to drink to calm her nerves, and Shira understandably cries as a result of the traumatic situation. Bernie, Sam, Casey, and Brian collect their cash, and Brian is suddenly summoned by one of Shira's lackeys. Shira asks about Kim and tells Brian the cons of working as a professional singer. And she also has one hell of a surprise for Brian. She gives him the number for her vocal coach, who will train Kim as she requires. The fee is on Shira, and her coach will then refer Kim to her manager, who will make sure Kim gets a shot at professional singing. Shira thanks Brian again for his heroism and gratefully kisses him on the cheek. The next day, it's lunchtime, and Kim eagerly runs to Brian, who is waiting at the restaurant. However, much to his disappointment, she is flanked by Lenore. Neither Brian nor Lenore are overjoyed to see each other, but are willing to put things on the back burner to let Kim say what's on her mind. Brian pushes her a raspberry and banana milkshake, and Kim brings Brian up to speed. Her friend Amanda has two cousins who live in Paris, and she really wants to go. Brian asks her why, and all I can think is, what teenager doesn't want to romp around Europe for a while? Kim says she wants to check out the various art museums in Paris. Brian quickly deduces that Kim will need his permission to leave the country since she's a minor. Kim tries making her case while Lenore produces the papers that need to be signed. Brian is reluctant as he's uncomfortable with his 17-year-old daughter traveling independently. As he takes a sip of his coffee, he offers to tag along and keep an invisible distance. Lenore says, yeah, you're a fucking deadbeat, of course you're good at being invisible. That clearly hurts Brian, who tries to mollify things by telling Kim about the singing lesson Shira offered. Kim runs away in frustration. Lenore doesn't understand why Brian won't sacrifice a little for Kim since he upended his life while working for the US government. Lenore then also reveals she thinks he's pathetic. As she leaves, Brian takes another sip of coffee, which he's definitely going to need before long. Brian pops back up to the outrageously large home with the signed papers. Kim is so excited she can't stop jumping around. Same, honestly. He hands her an international phone with a pre-programmed number. He wants her to call him when she lands at De Gaulle and every night before she goes to sleep. He also wants to drive her to the airport. Kim gives him two quick hugs and goes to show her mother. Once alone, Lenore coldly asks Brian if it'd be easier to sign it the first time. Brian tells her that he thinks it would have been easier if they discussed it privately and before Kim got involved. On their way to LAX, Brian gives Kim a list of sketchy neighborhoods to avoid. Kim doesn't want her father to worry, but Brian is just being a realist. Kim says she used to want to know all about his job, but would lose her nerve whenever he was around. She says she might have been afraid to find out about his crazy past, which Brian shrugs off as working for the government. Brian clarifies that he was a, quote, preventer who kept bad things from happening. Going forward, we can assume nobody needs to inform Brian of the deep magic created by criminals and shifty characters, since he was there when it was written. Kim asks if it was a good job working for the government as a preventer, and Brian says that it was. She then asks if he misses it, but Brian truthfully tells her that he missed her more. Kim gives him a kiss on the cheek. Pulling up to the appropriate terminal, Kim goes to chat with her friend Amanda. While unloading the car, Brian finds a AAA planning map of Europe with several major cities circled, and these major cities are all over the continent, not just Paris, France. Brian confronts Lenore, who has just pulled up, and she reveals that she advised Kim to keep the truth from Brian. Lenore reveals that Kim is following you two on their Vertigo tour, which is the tour that was identified on the Wikipedia page. Lenore says Stuart arranged for Kim to stay in the best hotels, but Brian says that Lenore is raising Kim in a sheltered bubble and that she won't know what the real world is like. Lenore has a golden eye for how cruel the world can be, and she just wants Kim to live her life a little, as she tells Brian. I mean, honestly, how can you be married to someone like Brian Mills and not pick up on how unfair the world can be? They both make good arguments, honestly, and Lenore tells Brian he has to loosen up a little or he'll lose Kim. Gosh, you have no idea how literal that sentiment becomes as this film goes on, Lenore. Once inside the airport, Brian snaps a picture of Kim and Amanda as they pass through security. Kim tells Brian she loves him and runs off, her bedazzled jean jacket practically sparkling under the fluorescent lights. The plane lands in Paris, with a most likely jet-lagged Kim and Amanda headed towards the cab stand. Amanda takes a picture of Kim standing next to a reflective sign, and a French man asks if they'd like a picture of the two of them. After taking this picture, he asks where they're from, and Amanda says they're from California. The man introduces himself as Peter, and Amanda makes the introductions. Peter asks if they're headed to Paris and offers to share a cab with them, since they're quite pricey. Back in Los Angeles, Brian has gotten another single picture developed in a flash and is checking the flight status quite compulsively, worried out of his mind. Amanda and Kim pull up to the apartment, and Amanda tells Peter that her cousins own the place and they're going to be in Madrid for the whole summer. Kim looks surprised, since Amanda didn't tell her that the cousins would be traveling. 
Peter then invites the two of them to a party. Kim seems a bit reluctant, but Amanda says Peter's hot, so that's all the information she needs. As the two girls head inside, Peter picks up his phone and secretly delivers the address in French, but in English says there are two girls around 18. Once they get settled, Kim tells Amanda that she wished she knew her cousins were going to be in Spain. Amanda says Kim already lied to her father about their plans. She then says she plans on having casual sex with Peter, encouraging Kim to lose her virginity in Paris. Amanda then turns on some music, way too loud for me, and begins dancing. Kim heads to the bathroom and doesn't realize her phone is ringing. Back at his apartment, Brian sits down, a bundle of nerves, and I can totally sympathize with him here. He calls again, and this time Kim answers. Brian scolds her for not calling him the moment she landed. Kim tells him that there was a huge rush at the airport, which is probably true, and Brian asks her for the number at the apartment. Kim stammers around and then reveals that Amanda's cousins are in Madrid, which surprises Brian. After locking herself in the bathroom, which gives us a good view of the living room from the bathroom window, Kim says she has no idea of the phone number, and Brian asks if she has any more bombs to drop. Just then, Kim notices two men surrounding Amanda. They grab her and begin escorting her away. Kim begins to panic, because who wouldn't panic here, and Brian bounces into action. Brian asks if she met anyone on the plane or in the airport as he sets up some recording equipment. Kim tells him about Peter and that he took a cab with them. Kim notices the men looking around for her and tells Brian she's scared. Brian tells her to be precise. She tells him there are three people and she's in the bathroom. Brian tells her to go to the next bedroom and lie on the floor under the bed. Kim does so and Brian tells her the next important part. They're going to take her. I apologize to everyone for my terrible Liam Neeson impression. It won't happen again. Brian tells Kim to stay focused and says that in the five seconds she'll have, she needs to shout out all the descriptors to the phone. Kim tearfully agrees to do so and puts the phone on the floor. They both hear footsteps and to her credit, Kim is able to stay very quiet. The men begin speaking in Albanian as the handy dandy subtitles informed me. They converse a bit longer, then walk away. Kim tells Brian they're leaving, and then she's dragged out from under the bed, screaming, but telling Brian, beard, six feet, tattoo, right hand, moon, and star. She is heard screaming and being dragged away. A shaken Brian quickly composes himself and begins that monologue we've all either seen in the movie or seen parodied, memed, and spoofed. He says that he doesn't have much money, but that he has a particular skill set that makes him a nightmare for criminals. If they release Kim, it'll be the end of it. But if they don't release her, he will look for them, he will find them, and he will kill them. Sorry, I guess I lied about shelving my terrible Liam Neeson impression. Suddenly, a condescending voice says in English, good luck, and disconnects. Quivering with anger and fear, Brian jumps into action and calls up Sam, needing him to run an analysis on the phone call he'd been recording. Brian zooms up to Lenore and Stewart's house where the streets have no name, probably because it's a private residence and not in an incorporated neighborhood. He says Kim's gone and asks Stewart if he has any enemies overseas, dropping quite a few tense business deals Stewart had coordinated a while back. Stuart takes offense to the background check, but tells Brian he doesn't have any enemies, at least none that he knows of. Brian tells the two that he got a call from Kim, which isn't exactly how it happened. I mean, he was the one calling Kim in an anxious parent frenzy, but whatever, stress does crazy things to a person, and I'm willing to overlook that slip of the tongue. Brian finds Kim's room and tells Stuart to get him a reservation on a private plane to Paris. While doing this, he finds Kim's diary with an old picture of the two of them, quite touching. Lenore begs Brian to bring him home to her, which Brian will absolutely do. He just needs to find her first. Brian then gets an incoming call from Sam, who starts info dumping. The kidnapper spoke Albanian and are from Tripoja, a ground zero location for sex traffickers in this movie's universe. And if you're familiar at all with the seven deadly sins, then you know Sam is more than familiar with the sin of lust. At any rate, the man Brian spoke to is Marco Ocha, who moved to Paris recently. The tattoo of a moon and stars is an identifying mark, kind of like the scorpion tattoos I give the villains in my Deathstalker series, available on Amazon. Realizing he's about to give some very sensitive and frightening information, Sam asks if he is on speaker, and Brian says Lenore is there. Sam tells her hello and calls her Lenny, but Lenore is not at all offended. She gives him a shaky hello, and Sam then tells Brian and Lenore this group's specialty is sex trafficking. Their old MO was to trick Eastern European women into taking jobs as au pairs and maids. They would then addict them to drugs and turn them into prostitutes. The trafficking ring then decided it's rather cheap to kidnap traveling women. Lenore begins to cry, and Sam tells the two that they have a 96-hour window to find Kim before she is never to be found. Lenore cries again, and I always get a lump in my throat at this scene. Thomka Jansen does anguish crying really, really well. On the private plane, Brian plays the recording over and over again, with a heavy emphasis on the condescending, good luck. The plane finally lands in Paris, the city of blinding lights, and the setting for the rest of this movie. 
Brian swings by the apartment, carrying a brown paper bag out of which sticks a French baguette. That Brian is a chameleon, he really knows how to look extra French. He does a thorough sweep of the apartment, trying to find all vantage points and areas of vulnerability that could have led to Kim and Amanda's abductions. Once inside, he still hasn't found what he's been looking for, since Kim is nowhere to be found and the living area is in a state of disarray. He imagines Amanda being snatched up, then realizes that Kim saw the scene through the window of the wraparound bathroom. He heads to the bathroom, doing a quick check of everything, and then transitions to the next bedroom. He inspects the bedroom carefully and finds the smashed glass of the mirror hanging on the wall. A chaotic flashback shows Kim struggling violently with the man who had dragged her out from under the bed like Robbie Freeling's clown doll. She put up a good fight, though, since her assailant had bashed his head against the glass mirror while struggling with her. Brian inspects the mirror closely and is able to pull out a hair attached to the sticky backer board. He then finds the smashed cell phone and retrieves the SIM card. Rookie mistake, Marco Ocha. Brian goes to a memory card downloader at the subway and is able to view all the pictures Kim had taken with her phone. He lands on the last one, where Kim and Amanda are were hugging next to the reflective sign at the cab stand. Brian moves the picture around and zooms in, finding a grainy image of Peter in the sign's reflection. He is able to clean it up, one part of procedural dramatizations that I really wish was real, it would help a lot of people. And we then get to see, clear as day, a very nice picture of Peter. We then cut to the airport, where Peter is given orders to follow a Swedish tourist who has just arrived. At the cab stand, he greets her and learns her name, Ingrid, in the same way and offers to share a cab with her. Brian knocks Peter into the cab, sparing Ingrid from a very, very horrible vacation. Brian brutally beats Peter, demanding to know about the two American girls from the other day. Peter's partner pulls Brian out of the cab and the two get into another quick-paced, brutal fight. Brian notices Peter has flown the coop and is running up the street. Brian speeds away in the cab to follow Peter. Peter is able to evade Brian by jumping over the guardrail and landing on the street below. He took one hell of a chance. His legs could have been snapped like breadsticks. However, Peter's luck has run out because as soon as he begins to gather his bearings, he is hit by a garbage truck. Brian looks away, disappointed and furious that his one connection has escaped and is headed toward the river Styx. Hey, at least Peter can bond with Eugenia Dermody, am I right? A French man who looks way too similar to Kevin Spacey leaves a shop and Brian covertly follows him. But it was all planned. These are two former spies we're talking about. This man is Jean-Claude Petrel, who works at a desk job as a law enforcement officer in Paris. Brian brings Jean-Claude up to speed and now only has 80 hours to find Kim. Jean-Claude says they need to find the spotter, but Brian says he's dead. Jean-Claude asks if he found him that way, but we all know that it's not like that. Brian did beat the crap out of Peter and then watched him get hit by a garbage truck, so, you know, I guess that answers your question. Jean-Claude says that he can't provide much help since he's now a desk jockey. He tells Brian to check out Port de Clichy and advises his friend not to fuck it up. He then dials reinforcements and asks them to tail Brian. For the rest of the day, Brian makes his way around Paris. Jean-Claude at his flat is telling his children the story of Little Red Riding Hood and his wife Isabelle hands off the phone. Jean-Claude advises the man on the other line not to let Brian trick him. Suspicious, no? In the red light district, Brian pulls up to Gregor Milosevic, an, an Albanian who produces his resume. He begins to tell Brian that he works as a translator and had been a school teacher before the wars, but Brian isn't too focused on his background. Brian asks for his rate, then renders that question moot by giving Gregor money for 10 hours of work. He tells Gregor to wait in the car for a minute, then goes over to a group of prostitutes. He flirts with one of the girls, who keeps asking if he wants to know the rate. He's clearly wasting her time, and she tells him to piss off if he's not buying. She tries approaching another car, but Brian steals her business. She says he's going to get her in trouble, and predictably, a mean-looking pimp comes up and smacks her on the side of her head. The pimp asks Brian why he's bothering her, and manhandles him. Brian is able to plant a listening device while the pimp tells him 50 euros, or he kicks Brian's ass. He hands over the 50 euros, and the pimp easily swipes another 50 for Brian being an asshole. Yeah, I'd wager that this pimp is a bigger asshole than Brian, but whatever. Brian walks off, but his job has been done. Gregor still has no idea what he has to do, but Brian loads up the receiver for the listening device and tells the translator to listen. Gregor says that the two men are talking about Brian, and then saying mean things, such as what an asshole he is. He then reveals that the men are discussing how a sausage gave one of them heartburn. The other man in the car has a remedy for that, courtesy of his grandmother. They're also discussing football between Lazio and Marseille and how they lost money. Now, one of them is on the phone, needing to do a job at a construction site where fresh merchandise is giving him problems. Gregor is promptly dismissed, but not before producing an English-Albanian dictionary per Brian's request. Brian arrives at the sketchy-looking construction site, intent on finding the, quote, fresh merchandise. 
Brian discreetly pays the entrance fee, then walks down the hall, looking for any sign of Ken. He unfortunately just finds drugged out and exhausted looking women who have been used and abused. This place is far from a discotheque, and if anything, is more a hell on earth for these poor innocent women. Brian eventually finds Kim's bedazzled jean jacket in one of the stalls and assaults the John. He knocks him out, then looks at the prostitute, who is not his daughter. She says, I'm good, several times. Her face is covered in sweat, and she's clearly too out of it. Brian holds the jean jacket, then fights his way out of the brothel, though he makes sure the surviving woman is taken with him. He loads her inside an abandoned hatchback, and one hectic car ride through the construction site later, Brian and the surviving woman are back in Paris. He gives the finger to someone tailing him, and then takes the woman to a safe place, but not without first changing and then hot-wiring another car. He arrives at Hotel Camellia, owned by an old friend. The old friend asks for the usual accommodation, and Brian says, plus one. He is given his keys, then fetches the woman. He takes her inside, then makeshifts a detoxification fluid and IV. He tucks her in, loads the IV, and injects her with the miracle drug lidocaine. He then fluffs out Kim's denim jacket and stares at it forlornly, probably wondering why things have to be so goddamned hard. He carefully sinks into a chair and tries to grab a few hours of sleep. However, his phone rings and it's a call from Jean-Claude. That morning, Jean-Claude is speaking on the phone with Brian, who is able to pick out Jean-Claude's partners. Jean-Claude produces a first-class plane ticket paid for by the French government. Brian asks about Kim, but Jean-Claude just borrows a phrase from Principal Figgins and says his hands are tied. No, he doesn't really say that, but he makes it out to be this huge bureaucratic thing that he, that he can't get involved in finding Kim. Brian is able to outfox the men who are tailing him, much to Jean-Claude's frustration. Brian tosses his burner phone in the trash and heads down to the metro to head back to Hotel Camellia. While writing down a simple message from his Albanian English dictionary, the young woman wakes and tries yanking out the IV. Brian tells her it's just fluids and medicine to counteract the drugs in her system. She eyes him warily and he asks her where she got the jacket. He shows her a picture of Kim and asks if she was the one who gave her the jacket. The woman quietly says she didn't steal it and that Kim gave it to her because she was cold. She said the jacket was given to her at the house with the red door, and we then see, in a flashback, this woman being abducted from a car by more sex traffickers, having been driven by another spotter. She tearfully says that Kim was in the house and was nice to her. Brian says that Kim's his daughter, and the young woman begins crying, clearly heartbroken and overwhelmed. At Brian's urging, she says the house was on Rue de Paradis. Brian heads to the house with the red door, which I really want to paint black, and speaks with two members of the trafficking ring. Pretending he's a fed, he strong arms them into letting him inside. Once he's with the head haunches of the trafficking ring, he notices one with a star and moon tattoo on his hand. Brian says he's here to negotiate rates. The traffickers said they already negotiated, but Brian tells them that their supposed contact switched offices. Deception comes quite easily to him, but I don't really care how the traffickers feel about dishonesty. At any rate, Brian begins pontificating to the group about costs skyrocketing lately and asks about Marco. One of them says they're all Marco and they're all from Traposia. Brian is able to get them to bend by way of money talks and insisting that he's not going to play their head game. While the money exchanges hands, good old extortion, the X makes it sound cooler, Brian hands over his handwritten note to one of the men at the table. He reads the message and they all begin laughing. Brian asks the man to translate the message and this man says, good luck. And that's all Brian needs. Brian glances at the other men who could pose a threat and says to Marco Ocha, you don't remember me. We spoke on the phone two days ago. I told you I would find you. I know that's my third strike for a horrible Liam Neeson impression, but how can you not do a Liam Neeson impression with this movie? He is so fucking badass. At any rate, another brutal fight scene begins. Brian makes mincemeat out of the traffickers, though he spares Marco since he'll need him. Brian kills the other reinforcements who try to escape, then travels through the house looking for Kim. Instead, he finds very sad scenes. Drugged up women handcuffed to beds, too listless to fight. He goes into one bedroom thinking he's found Kim, but it's not her. He then heads to another bedroom and finds Amanda, who has died of a drug overdose and has vomit on her shirt, not unlike Jane Margolis. A sad and Brian leaves. Brian wakes up the captured trafficker by, uh, look, this is what happens in the unrated version. He stabs the thug in the thighs with metal conductors. Sounds fun. In the rated version, which is the one that I'm currently watching, he simply shouts at him and connects jumper cables to the chair to which the thug is tied. At any rate, it's a bad situation for Marco Ocha from Traposia. Brian holds a picture of Kim and demands to know where she is. Marco spits in Brian's face. Brian activates the electricity and the jumper cable sends shocks through Marco's body. Brian then tells him this form of torture used to be outsourced to countries with unpredictable power grids. But in France, the power is stable. You can flip a switch and the power stays on all day. Brian asks again and Marco spits in his face again. Peyton Westlake would have lost his mind, but Brian is able to keep his fury locked in. 
A dark man he is not. Brian tells Marco he doesn't have any time to waste and that if Marco doesn't start talking, Brian will leave the switch on until the power company complains. Marco says he sold Kim for a hefty sum because she's a virgin. Marco doesn't know who bought Kim, but eventually says Sinclair, who is a person. Patrice Sinclair. Brian asks where he can find Sinclair, but Marco genuinely has no idea. Brian goes to turn the power back on, and Marco pleads and cries for him to stop. Brian believes Marco, though, but it's not going to save him. He then switches on the power, leaving Marco to die. I bet Liam Neeson is a bit relieved he's the person saying, I'm not going to kill you, but I don't have to save you. Jean-Claude comes home with another baguette, proving Brian was right about that making him look genuinely French. Jean-Claude is greeted by his children, and his wife, Isabelle, reveals that Brian stopped by for a late spot of dinner. She tells Jean-Claude to tuck the children in, and after doing so, Jean-Claude reaches into the cabinet under the bathroom sink and withdraws a handgun, though he doesn't even bother to check if the magazine is full. Isabelle is a very nice hostess, telling Brian how much she likes Jean-Claude's new schedule. Brian asks for the best kind of chicken meat, dark, and begins talking to Jean-Claude about a contact for the Albanian traffickers. Brian hopes his friend isn't involved in that shit, and Isabelle wants to know the goings-on in Jean-Claude's office. Ignoring her, Jean-Claude tells Brian that he doesn't care where his extra money comes from. He was going to help Brian only if it meant no trouble. Jean-Claude then whips out the gat and points it at Brian, screaming at his terrified wife to shut up. Nice guy. So yeah, magpies, the cat's out of the bag. Jean-Claude looks the other way and actively assists sex traffickers, pocketing a decent payment for himself. He flat out doesn't stop to think of the inhumanity and cruelty of his work and doesn't even bend his own fucked up rules to help an old friend. He's the classic corrupt cop character, one that you can actively hate, but one that I'm sure my DCAU enjoyers are more than familiar with. It wouldn't be a vigilante story without an immoral bureaucrat who looks the other way, am I right? Brian calmly reaches into his pocket and dumps the bullets on the dinner table, saying that therein lies the difference between field and office work. Jean-Claude forgot how a loaded gun feels versus one that is unloaded. To demonstrate his lesson, Brian whips out the gat and shoots Jean-Claude's poor, innocent wife in the arm. Yeah, Brian, kind of an asshole move. That woman had no idea her husband was a shifty bureaucrat, and her rose-tinted glasses are now smeared with her own blood. Jean-Claude swears at Brian, but Brian gives a simple ultimatum. Jean-Claude gives him the information Brian wants, or Isabelle and Jean-Claude's children will be orphans. Jean-Claude begrudgingly agrees to Brian's conditions because, duh. After Jean-Claude confirms Patrice Sinclair was his point man, Brian thanks Jean-Claude for the information and requests his old French friend apologize to his wife for the disruption. He then whacks Jean-Claude on the head and leaves the apartment. Yeah, it must suck to be Isabelle. Not only are you essentially tortured by a cowboy of a vigilante, but you find out your husband looks the other way with sex trafficking and couldn't even adequately protect the home. Not a fun night for sure. In all honesty, in all honesty though, I do feel for Isabel, a totally innocent victim just like Kim and Amanda. At a swanky party, Patrice Sinclair is seen greeting several people before excusing himself to speak with somebody else. Brian is able to bluff his way inside and covertly follow Sinclair. He is stopped at the elevator and produces his fake police badge. The attendant says he's not on the list, but as Muscle Man says, you can let that guy in. He seems legit. Brian beats the goon unconscious, then sneaks around corners, looking for anyone who can bring him to Sinclair. It's a tense scene, but at the same time, I can't help but admire the gorgeous marble walls. We need more marble walls in the United States, honestly. Brian is approached by a passing waiter and is able to take his chilled champagne. He takes out a guard, then sneaks into a private room. A bikini-clad woman is standing on the stage, being auctioned like she were an unpaid storage locker. It's quite disgusting, especially how the buyers are completely emotionless and don't care one whit about the woman's pain, suffering, and destroyed future. One man speaks in Arabic while Brian stands behind him rather obtrusively. The next woman is presented, revealed as someone who speaks English and some French and is certified pure. Brian, who has been pouring champagne, dribbles on Ali, the Arabic speaker. At least they're not in the bathroom, right? An angered Ali tells Brian to leave right as the woman on the stage is turned around and we get to see it's Kim, terrified and near tears. The bidding starts at $100,000. Brian holds Ali at gunpoint and forces him to buy Kim. He cocks the gun and Ali gradually outbids, but Brian gets impatient and bids for Kim himself. She is sold for $500,000, and the automated voice tells the buyers they can pick up their purchases soon. Brian forces Ali at gunpoint out of the buying room, but is knocked unconscious by Sinclair's men. Brian wakes up with his wrists handcuffed around an overhead pipe. Sinclair taunts Brian briefly and wants to know why Brian is there. Brian reveals the last woman purchased is his daughter. Sinclair sarcastically wishes he could give Kim back since he has three kids of his own. He says that this is a unique business with a unique clientele. More like a disgusting business with a disgusting clientele. 
All sales are final and discretion are the only two rules. Sinclair orders for Brian to be quietly killed as he's hosting people. Brian is strangled from behind by one of Sinclair's men, but is able to break the overhead pipe, which bonks two men on the head and gives nasty steam burns to another two. Brian then knocks out another one with a fire extinguisher and launches it at another man. He grapples with a henchman for the gun and is able to shoot the schoon in the leg. Sinclair, who left before this action carried out, is upset by the noise, but that's going to be the least of his worries since Brian has killed all of his men and uncuffed himself. He shoots Sinclair, who tries bargaining. Brian prepares to execute a wounded Sinclair, who tries to cover his ass by saying it was just business, nothing personal. He also reveals that there is a boat nearby where the girls are being shipped. I get that he's in the death throes, but it takes a really sadistic person lacking a modicum of empathy to describe forced prostitution as just business. Brian says it was personal to him and shoots Sinclair to death, leaving his body in the elevator. Now he has a machine gun, ho ho ho. Brian chases Ali down the street, keeping a sharp eye on the careening car. Brian Mills may as well change his name to Barry Allen the way he's jogging through the streets of Paris. He manages to spot the boat and continues sprinting until he's able to incapacitate a guard and steal a car. Through some nifty driving, Brian is able to speed towards the boat, maneuver around other motorists, and gather enough speed to catch up. Ali meets with his boss, Rahman, who is an older man wearing a bathrobe and lying seductively on the bed. The women are almost ready, he says in Arabic. They are being prepared, sir. Brian stops the car and races toward the bridge. He leaps over the side and lands in a nice roll where he then headlocks a guard to the point of unconsciousness. Brian quietly descends the staircase of the boat and is able to take out another guard, tossing him into the sin. In sin in the mem membrane, anyone? No? Okay. The women are now being escorted to Rahman. Ali grabs a few other muscle heads as reinforcements. Brian takes out a fair number of goons on his own, but Ali takes a break from the fight to tell Rahman that Brian is the father of one of the girls. Brian is then sidelined by a returning Ali's bullet, which pierces his arm. He is then slashed, and it's clear that this is the most physically taxing fight of them all. But he is eventually able to stab Ali twice, taking him out of the action. Wounded and limping about, Brian grabs a gun and bursts into Raman's room, where he is holding a knife to Kim's neck. Brian readies his gun, and Raman tries negotiating with Brian, only to be shot in the face. Risky shot, but Brian's headed up to here with all this shit. Kim stares in shock at Brian and says, You came for me. She begins to cry, and Brian says, I told you I would. The tears are already rolling down my face, magpies, but who wouldn't share a tear at the scene? All the tension has passed, and the two are reunited. It's good stuff, and Maggie Grace is just as good at anguished crying as Fomka Jansen, so I guess it was good casting to make these two actresses mother and daughter. Runs in the family. Back in the States, Brian and Kim had landed. Kim runs right for her mother in another scene that makes me want to cry. Stuart takes Brian's suitcase and offers to give him anything he needs. Brian says he's got everything he needs right here. Lenore tearfully thanks Brian and gives him a warm, friendly hug. The foursome leave this nightmare over. However, Brian is going to take a cab home, even after, after Stuart offers to give him a ride. Kim gives her father one more hug and tells him she loves him. He reciprocates and watches her leave with a proud smile. And then it's back to his dark apartment where a nice stiff drink would probably go over perfectly. I'm thinking a Qui-Gon gin and tonic myself. Sometime later, Kim and Brian are at someone's doorstep. Kim has no idea who they're going to see, but none other than pop sensation Shira answers the door with a warm, inviting smile. Shira says she heard Kim wants to be a singer, and a starstruck Kim says yes, reacting the same way I did when I met Brad Dourif at Texas Frightmare, only without a lot less excitedly nervous giggling. Shira welcomes the two inside her home as the film draws to a close. And that concludes the synopsis of Taken. Let's move on to the personal review, shall we? Taken is without a doubt one of my favorite action movies. The message is heavy and emotional, the stakes are higher than Cheech and Chong on April 20th, the film itself looks chaotic and washed out, which makes you feel very, very exhausted the way you should feel when you're watching this movie. The two heavy themes of this movie include the horrors of sex trafficking and the feelings of estrangement between a parent and a child, both of which are scary things to deal with. While Europe is not an innately dangerous continent, the threat of sex trafficking makes traveling to any location a terrifying reality. And to reiterate, sex trafficking can happen anywhere, but it's mostly disadvantaged women who are being targeted rather than wealthy tourists like Kim Mills. Kidnapping Kim was a huge oversight by the villainous group we see in this movie, and it's safe to say that had her father not been an ass-kicking commando, she could have either met a fate similar to Amanda's, or she would have wound up like the prostitute Brian encountered initially in Paris. It's a brutal, poignant film that reminds you how vulnerable so many innocent people are. People who are conned, drugged, people who are cast aside by society and deemed not worthy of, of intervention and rescue, and people who are coerced into doing things that they never wanted to do. 
Taken is heartbreaking in more ways than one. We see a dramatized account of involuntary prostitution and human trafficking, and we see fates of drugging, rapes, abuse, and deaths in a way that is very scary and real. There is no glossy overlay to any of the horrors Brian encounters throughout the film. And honestly, I'm glad that this film is cold and washed out. It informs the audience, especially filmgoers who were maybe not familiar with sex trafficking, that this is an abysmal environment. If this film were shot in a way that was glossy or attractive, it could have downplayed the seriousness of the film. Sex trafficking is a horrific, gruesome crime, and I don't want to discuss it lightly. I am nowhere near qualified to discuss the nature of sex trafficking beyond finding it to be repugnant and cruel. I've linked some articles in the description of this episode, though, which address myths, misconceptions, and resources that can be helpful around the topic of sex trafficking. Now, in regards to the film itself, with the other theme that I mentioned about parental child estrangement, Brian and Kim are clearly quite fond of each other, and you want them to be reunited. Brian, due to the demanding nature of his work as a CIA operative, was not nearly as involved in his daughter's life as he wants to be. Kim positively adores him, but Lenore would rather Brian be kept at arm's length. She does not want his instability to negatively impact Kim more than it already has, and while that is a reason that makes sense, it certainly causes Brian a lot of pain. He retired in order to be more, a more present father, and his attempts at improving this relationship are, as Bon Scott would say, shot down in flames. However, you can't deny that Kim loves Brian so much and wants a relationship with him. I'm sure she's heard stories from her mother over the years because that's a natural thing to do, but I do find it quite touching that she wants to get to know Brian better and she wants to improve their relationship despite all these outside kind of uh, elements making it difficult for the two of them to grow as father and daughter. One thing about Taken that has always devastated me was the level of preparation Brian took to get Kim ready for her European trip. He gave her an excellent cell phone, detailed instructions, and even went against his own gut instincts just to make her happy. He spent years of his life keeping his interests safe. He was master fighter and strategist, and he had undying love for his family. He took every contingency plan known to man and beast, but it still blew up in his face. Brian's worst fears were his daughter being in harm's way, and what do you know, it happened the first time he let his guard down. He never wanted to let his guard down, he compromised his own feelings so as not to appear controlling or overprotective. And after letting his guard down, the worst thing possible happened. His daughter is kidnapped and about to be sold into sexual slavery when all she wanted to do was have a fun time in Europe with her friend. Brian realizing that his daughter will be abducted is done in a way that is powerful. Right after preparing his tracking equipment, he breaks the startling news to her. He can't comfort her or tell her he loves her. He needs to get her head in the game and he needs to get her prepared for what will come. Not being able to comfort her or tell her everything is okay was clearly devastating for Brian, but his preparing her to give him the most vital information was the best possible outcome in the event that Kim was kidnapped. The fact that Kim was able to give Brian the information he requested was another level of preparation. We don't get to see much of Kim's childhood when her parents were married, but it's abundantly clear that all she needed was a prod in the right direction and she could keep her head cool in a crisis. She may have been panicked and anxious, which are completely normal reactions, but she was still able to get down to business as quickly as possible. She kept her head on straight during an extremely stressful time and was able to get her father a head start to find her. Still, both Kim and Brian were thrust into the lion's den even though they'd done everything right, Brian in particular. He had everything ready to go, yet you can't count on a person to do everything you ask of them by the letter. I think Brian definitely should have reminded Kim not to speak with strangers, but that was one little step he had missed. There are tons of young people who want to travel about and have new experiences and see new things, but not everyone walks away without a scratch. There are mass shootings, serial killers, sex trafficking, fatal encounters with nature, and plane crashes. This film explored one of the darkest criminal activities and reminded some naive filmgoers that these dangers are always lurking and there isn't always Liam Neeson out to save you. Kim's story was one in a million. Young people, especially women, are victimized by these horrific groups frequently, but few are rescued. It's a heartbreaking situation, and I'm glad that sex trafficking itself is receiving more attention. This is an issue that is not unique to one country or group. There needs to be more attention paid to victims of all races and creeds, and there needs to be more done to help these individuals have a new start after a horrifying period of abuse and control. The last thing I want to mention to wrap up this little review is to bring us back to Kim, Brian and Kim's relationship. I think the ending of Taken is one of the saddest and most triumphant ends to a movie, and I genuinely mean that. Brian calmly and coolly executes the pervert holding Kim at knife point. He doesn't lose a wink of sleep over this decision and does so in a way that is a relief. 
No negotiating with a man who takes advantage of drugged, kidnapped women. Brian got shit done, and Kim, predictably in shock, can only say that he came for her. Brian says softly, I told you I would, and now that the threat has passed and the horizon is seen a bit more clearly, Kim dissolves into heartbroken sobbing, being held and supported by her father. It's a scene that gets me to tear up every time, and that's entirely because of how weighty it is. Kim has been through hell. She may have been spared the horrific treatment that Amanda and the girl from the hotel were subjected to due to her being a virgin, but that doesn't mean her time was one of wine and roses. She was most likely closely inspected, assaulted, and berated in ways that were foreign to her. I'm sure she had resigned herself to the probability that she would never see her mother or father again, which is one hell of a traumatic thing to, as to accept. But seeing Brian there, killing the people who made her life hell, it's good stuff. She knows that her father is a man who is willing to put his life on the line for her, and she knows he's a man who keeps his word. And when she goes to him, she sobs openly and painfully, not unlike a child. Her crying gets to me, similarly to how the crying in Hereditary got to me. And I'm sure Brian wants to cry too, tears of relief and happiness, but he's so exhausted he can't. And he also wants to be strong for Kim. He's going to let her have a reaction in a way that is healthy and cathartic. He may want to digest what had happened and have a healthy response, but he's there for, her, for his daughter first and foremost. He may be this badass former soldier and espionage officer, but he is a father above all else, and that is a theme that I really love to see with Taken. Now, I do think the three principal actors deserve a special mention. Liam Neeson plays an absolute badass who won't stop at anything to get Kim back. Neeson plays it perfectly. He masters the deep emotions associated with Brian just as well. Fear, anxiety, worry, heartbreak, and cold, clear determination. Brian's facade seldom cracks, but he carries an air of sadness throughout the film. It's a realistic reaction that makes you feel for the character while remaining intimidated by his physical prowess. I'm always surprised by Liam Neeson's 6'4 frame. Nearly every movie of his I've seen, he's in a frame with tall, statuesque actors and actresses. But shrugging that off, he appears as a man with a muscular frame, though an unassuming muscular frame. That makes him a perfect candidate for a former badass. He's someone who can blend in and can also move around effortlessly. Brian's physique reminds me of the justification for casting Adrian Brody as the protagonist of Predators, which will include a very brief tangent of mine. Predator, the 1987 action classic, featured Arnold Schwarzenegger in the starring role. Arnold Schwarzenegger is a man of a physical fortitude and impressive muscles. I mean, he was Mr. Universe and is almost a template for the modern iteration of the Greek god physique. In Predator, Arnold's character Dutch was a soldier for the U.S. Army, Austrian accent notwithstanding. When Adrian Brody was announced as the starring role for Predators, the third film in the franchise, some critics pointed out his thin, lithe physique, arguing he was hardly on the same level as Arnold. But it's a fact that a lot of times men who are, are a little thinner and have that kind of muscular frame tend to excel in special forces, and this is what we see with Brian Mills, aka Liam Neeson's character. Liam Neeson may be a tall man with an apparently thin, muscular frame, but he is able to move around quite fluidly and easily, never once appearing that the fights are getting to him, except for the last fight when he gets shot and slashed. The fact that Brian can easily blend in with the rest of the populace helps reinforce the badass he'd been as a young man and continues to be as one in his middle age. Brian is able to seamlessly camouflage himself in any given setting and as a result he appears to be underestimated by the villains of the film. He's a born strategist and a dark horse in terms of physical fighting, at least where his rivals and enemies are concerned. Circling back around to the other actors I wanted to highlight, Famke Janssen gives a good performance as Lenore. She is able to portray panic and intense grief as though it were second nature, and her anguish tugs at my heartstrings every time. When Sam reveals that Kim could be lost forever, her screams are haunting and send a chill up my spine. I can't imagine what it's like to be a parent whose child has gone missing and is in the clutches of disgusting criminals, and it's fair to say that I never want to be in such a situation. Jansen is able to sell the emotional trauma of the scene quite well, and fun fact, she was the Goodwill Ambassador for Integrity for the United Nations Office on Drugs and Crime. She seems like a deeply compassionate woman, and I'm glad that she was able to lend her excellent skills as a thespian to Taken. And I'd be an idiot to skip Maggie Grace as Kim. Kim Mills is a role that needed to be sympathetic, naive, and lovable. Kim was all of those qualities, to a T, and she was played magnificently by Grace. Kim is a cheerful child, despite her uber-privileged upbringing, and she absolutely loves and adores her father, even though he was absent for significant periods of her life. She sees the good in Brian, whereas Lenore can only see disappointment with him. But Kim actively wants her father in her life and excuses his absences, never once doubting that he loves her, at least on screen. However, like most teenagers, she forgets the rules Brian gives her before she heads off to a foreign country, practically on her own. She was also most likely encouraged off-screen to conceal the true na reason for her trip from Brian in a way that was orchestrated by Lenore. Kim doesn't really think of how hiding these crucial little details is a huge smack in the face to Brian, and she doesn't really think of how her father worries for her almost constantly. 
Kim's young and naive, but we can't dislike her for that. Later on in the film, Kim gives her bedazzled jean jacket to another abducted woman out of the kindness of her own heart. Though her being a virgin does not make her more worthy of a gunfire beck and rescue, an issue that I do take with the film, Kim is thoroughly kind and compassionate. It's clear through her exchanges with Amanda that Kim feels a little uncomfortable deceiving her father, while Amanda is all about keeping crucial secrets and lightly pokes fun at Kim's worry regarding Brian finding out the truth. All of these elements are played to perfection by Maggie Grace, and I'm glad she was able to return for the two sequels and bring more depth to Kim's character. And it wouldn't be an episode of Vin